Thank you, Peter. Not like him, I did manage to eat all my lunch, so I'm well sustained, and it was delicious. And I've had really good news from Queensland, actually, because that's where I come from. And at the moment, uh, there are over 6,000 people marching through the streets of Brisbane for life in, in Queensland, so I'm, yeah. I'm pretty excited about that. But I'm also very sad today because I realised from previous speakers that ACL staff don't get a nice gift. I noticed that. <laughs> and there's only one left and there's two speakers, so I'm, not, I'm thinking I'm unlucky. <laughs> anyway. Um, as it's been close to a year now since the ACL started the Centre for Human Dignity, and since that time, uh, we've worked alongside global partners, and our vision is to see Australia become a nation in which every man, woman and child is valued as God intended and able to live free from sexual exploitation. We want children's innocence to be protected, and we want human dignity to be dignity to be extended to all in light of the fact that human dignity actually originates and exists because we've been created in the image of God. So being straight after lunch, I just thought um, everyone would enjoy settling back and enjoy, enjoy hearing a good story. And I, I'm a, I, a bit of a stickler for good stories. So let me tell you about this woman that's on the screen. Her name is Josephine Butler. Now Josephine was born on the 13th of April 1828 in Northumberland in the UK. She grew up in a comfortable and deeply Christian family. Her father's name was John Gray and he was a public advocate for the abolition of slavery. Now, it was said of John Gray that he could not endure to see oppression or wrong of any kind inflicted on man, woman or child. Now Mr Gray was not a typical dad of those um, days in that era because he treated his daughters a, as equals. He educated them um, not only uh, in, in academic education but he educated them including um, social issues such as the horrors of slavery. Now, from a young age Josephine had a deep Christian faith and she felt the calling on her life to be a voice for change. She was appalled uh, by the slavery um, of young women and children particularly, and children as young as 12 years old, uh, that they were being uh, moved from England to Europe for the purpose of prostitution. And her campaigning on their behalf led her to visit brothels and jails. She viewed her war, she said, as a consecrated rebellion. Now this strengthened her as she faced down thugs, she faced down public ridicule and slander, and there are many of us who have faced down similar things in our day. But her decision um, not only to enter brothels but to advocate for prostitutes was absolutely shocking to society. And so during the, in the streets she would have mud and even excrement thrown at her. She wrote about this um, experience but she wrote particularly about her experience going into brothels and she said this, Hell hath opened her mouth. I stand in the near presence of the powers of evil. What I see and hear are the smoke of the pit. Josephine married George Butler and he was a scholar and a clergyman and like her father, George also treated her as an equal and fully supported her campaigns. Just an aside, if there's young people here still considering um, your marriage partner, choose wisely who you marry and Josephine chose wisely. Her walk, work forced her to speak against the mindset and actions that were common to men of her time and I would say to you, common to men of our time too. As a young wife, her husband actually worked at Oxford and here, what happened there at Oxford, one uh, particular incident that happened uh, made her aware very deeply of the double standards that existed for men and women. Um, a respected Oxford tutor seduced a very young girl who ended up being pregnant. She was left destitute and in a desperate situation and because of that, she actually killed her newborn and she was put in jail. Now, Josephine was enraged with the tutor because he was an older man with power, connections and authority and he had taken advantage of a young girl. And not only that, uh, whilst the, cr the girl's crime was undeniable and Josephine did not defend her crime, but Josephine was angered that the girl was punished while the man who created the situation retained public respect and he faced no consequences. Once, so once that girl had completed her jail time, uh, Josephine and her husband George hired her to work in their home and they rescued her really I would say from a certain very dark future. So that's the type of Christians that Josephine and George were. 
But can I say, Josephine did not oppose men. Um, that would be unthinkable for her because um, she, she had such an amazing heritage of men in her life. But she very publicly opposed the all-too-common belief of her time and that is a belief that remains prevalent today and that is that men who used prostitutes were simply indulging a natural impulse. She would later say this. She said, It seems strange that I should have been engaged in taking up the cudgel against men when my father, brothers, husband and sons have all been so good. Now, I very closely identify with Josephine on this because my father, my husband, my son, my sons-in-law, my brothers-in-law, the men I work with, Martin Isles, um, they are all good men. They are godly men and I trust them. But because I understand where she's coming from, I can't help but believe that it was her knowledge of good men that spurred her on to advocate for change in ungodly attitudes for the sake of those who were not as blessed as her. But it was not Josephine's father and it wasn't Josephine's husband or son that had the most impact on her. Rather, it was another man. And that man has had the most impact on me as well. And the man I refer to, of course, is Jesus himself. In, in the tender and respectful way um, that Jesus added, acted towards women, and that includes prostitutes, we see a vastly different way to view womanhood and redemption than we see in the world, in Josephine's world and in our world. Now, Josephine Butler's influence was vast. She successfully changed parts of the Prostitution Act of her day and she was also responsible for raising the age of consent to 16, which was a huge problem for the young girls who were taken in prostitution of the day. Josephine also helped set up an organisation. Um, she And I, I love this because I've helped set up the Centre for Human Dignity and I find this woman just so, in, so um, engaging. She helped to set up an organisation to lobby government against the legislative system of their day they believed that this organisation believed that the legislative system of her day officially sanctioned a double standard of sexual morality whilst it justified male sexual access to prostitutes at the same time it penalised women for engaging in the act of prostitution. So on the 31st of December 1869, the Ladies National Association, that was her organisation, they published a statement in the Daily News that it had been formed for the purposes of obtaining the repeal of certain parts of these laws, and they called them obnoxious laws. Now, among the 124 signatories on that um, statement uh, that was published was the social reformer Florence Nightingale. Isn't that just so beautiful? Josephine died on the 30th of December 1906, and she had accomplished so much with her life, but not many people know her name. Um, but there is still, can I say to you now, there is still so much work to be done and a new generation of advocates have risen up to take up the cause. And here in Western Australia, you have an adopt Nordic group that have taken up the cause that Josephine was fighting so long ago. We heard earlier today from ACL's Western Australian State Director and he's been leading us through the whole day and Peter spoke of the Nordic model of prostitution legislation which we believe best supports human dignity. And we will continue to advocate for this legislation in Western Australia, but also in every Australian state. South Australia are currently examining their prostitution laws and we're running a parliament in their panel just in a few weeks' time. Christopher Brohier, our, um, state, our state person over there in South Australia, is organising that. And uh, can I say to you that South Australia is actually considering um, currently a really wild west form of legislation to legalise prostitution which in reality will actually legalise abuse. So why does someone like um, Peter Abetz care about those trapped in prostitution and why do I and why should you? Um, why is it a major issue for the Centre for Human Dignity and it's simply because Jesus cared? And because, like Josephine Butler, I had a home where I was loved and protected and guided, that's why I care too. And because my husband is faithful and good. And God cares for every man, woman and child because we are created in his image. And so we need to care. Now, the prevalence of pornography in our, um, in our culture is another big issue that I just want to tackle. Uh, and it is linked this is another big issue that the Centre for Human Dignity is fighting against. 
And actually, there are, I would say, there are three issues that are um, inextricably linked in the areas of, of exploitation, and they are prostitution, trafficking, and pornography. Pornography is perhaps closer to home to most Australians than prostitution and trafficking, and particularly in our church communities. And as I approach this issue, I, I want um, this afternoon for you to allow me to speak truth and to do it in love, as Jesus instructed us to do, because in a room of this size, there is very little doubt in my mind that many of you will have been personally affected in some way by pornography. Pornography is actually changing human beings and it is changing our society and we cannot afford to ignore it because in reality, we are all affected by it. The prevalence of pornography in our culture and the diabolical damage it leaves in its wake is why ACL's research director, Dr Elizabeth Taylor, who you've heard from just before. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. She undertook an extensive research project on behalf of the Centre for Human Dignity. Uh, you may have seen or picked up a copy outside already. We have copies of the report here today. I do commend it to you uh, for your information, but it is primarily directed towards members of parliament as we seek to shift the cultural norms around the acceptance of pornography. We want to do this in the same way that cultural thinking changed around smoking, for instance. I grew up going to school in a bus where you couldn't see the front of the bus from the back of the bus because everybody smoked in the bus. And it was something that was so seen as something completely normal. When smoking was recognised as harmful to our health, our government acted. And so we need our government to act on pornography. There's many ways that they can, and I'm not going to go into all of them today, but stay in touch with the centre and you'll see which, which ways we're pushing the government to do this and also how you can help. Because even more than our government needing to take a stand, I would say to you today lovingly, the children of God need to make a stand on this and call it for what it is because it is an abomination. Australians are trapped in the lie that pornography sells and it is a lie that is destroying, it destroys the consumers, it shatters relationships with family, with spouses and even with God. Australia ranks eighth worldwide in pornography consumption. Pornography, and these aren't statistics that I've taken off some Christian website, these, this is very solid research. Pornography accounts for more than 35% of all internet downloads. 70% of Australian men view pornography either regularly or sporadically and devastatingly the, wildly, the widely accepted percentage of men in churches who are viewing pornography is 60%. Can I clarify though that it's not just men, it is also women who are viewing pornography but the vast majority of all pornography is of men exploiting women. So whether it's men or women watching it, that is what, that is what pornography is about. How absolutely opposite to Jesus' behaviour to women? And how can we possibly entertain a behaviour that grieves the heart of God? And I would ask the question, and I ask it of myself as well as all of you here, can we truly claim to love God if we indulge in this type of behaviour? It's incredibly serious. Perhaps most serious of all for our children, never before have we brought up a generation where hardcore pornography is accessible 24-7. A 2015 Telstra report showed that the average age of first smartphone ownership is now 12. So that's the average um, ownership of a smartphone. And I know that that's true in my own family. We have 10 grandchildren and a number of them are 15, 14, 12. They do have a smartphone because they go on the bus to school. The report showed that even 10-year-olds spend an average of around 15 hours every week on their phones. Now, this is back in 2015. By the age of 17, this rises to an average of 26 and a half hours a week. With pornography readily acceptable, readily available via our smartphones, there is absolutely no question, and I don't think anyone actually questions it, that this generation has more access to pornography than anyone in human history ever. 67% of pornography viewing happens on a smartphone. In only three years between 2008 and 2011, as the smartphone actually became available, the percentage of children under the age of 13 exposed to pornography jumped from 14% to 49%. There was a recent news report um, in Queensland where I live and it focused on the 
and what are called an unprecedented number of boys of 11 and 12 years old calling Australia's helpline, um, the counselling service that we have, the helpline for kids, asking for help. And they were calling because they were worried they had become addicted to pornography. They are 11 and 12 years old. So then it should not surprise us that the Australian Bureau of Statistics figures relating to sexual offences committed by school-aged children quadrupled from 430 in 2007 to 1,709 in 2011. And again, we're talking seven-year-old statistics. The average age of first exposure to pornography is now seen to be 11 years old, and this is often by accident, and this is where our government can actually come in. But back in 2007, there was a study by internet security company McAfee, we all know their name, so they're um, very credible. They revealed that there was a one in 14 chance of a child typing in a misspelled URL and stumbling upon a porn site by accident. Can you imagine what it is now that's over a decade later from that statistic? But let's be clear. Clicking on something exploited, it might be an accident by the user and particularly a child. But it's a carefully planned marketing move by the industry that preys on the vulnerable because there is huge financial incentive for getting users hooked on this content. Pornography is an industry. It's an industry that is based on the exploitation of girls and women worldwide and it's a very lucrative industry. Currently worth an estimated $100 billion globally. And if I put that into perspective, that's more revenue than Microsoft. On the screen is a graph which depicts the annual revenue statistics for pornography, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, eBay and Yahoo. And if you look carefully, you can see that the revenue from pornography is about twice the combined revenue of Google, eBay, Yahoo and Netflix. In the past few years, Australia, um, in Australia we have devoted significant resources to changing attitudes towards domestic violence. But the numbers are not going down. Some alarming statistics are on the screen right now. And in Queensland, where I live, the director of the Gold Coast Centre Against Sexual Violence, her name is Di McLeod, she's not a somebody of faith, but she's a, a really strong woman fighting for the rights of, of um, children and women in domestic violence. And she points the finger of blame for the increase in domestic violence directly at pornography. In the past five years, her centre alone has experienced a 56% increase in referrals from their hospital emergency department. And she has said that our domestic violence crisis is being driven by abusers who are consumed by pornography, which depicts the harmful behaviours being acted out. Viewing dehumanising content not only normalises dominance and abuse, but it diabolically connects that abuse to acts of love and intimacy. It is impossible to actually escape the facts. The objectification of women in pornography is essential to the commercial success of the product. The message that women love being degraded, hurt, injured and insulted is the crucial message that pornography communicates to a predominantly male audience and inevitably this message is reshaping our understanding of sexuality as God intended. Now, as a mother and a grandmother, I've always looked out for obscure and less known Bible stories that I can tell my children. And I read one the other day in my quiet time. Martin is obviously going to be totally over this because it's about one of the kings. And I didn't realise he was a scholar and the kings of the Bible. But it <laughs> relates to Jehoiakim, who was king of Judah. And the historian Josephus also mentions um, him. So did the Babylonian Chronicles. Um, the rabbinical literature describes him in, and it's in the British Museum. They describe him as a godless tyrant who committed atrocious sins and crimes. So Jehoiakim, the particular story I want to retell as I draw to a close today happened in the ninth month, which is great because we're on the first pinch and a punch for the first of the month, you know, the ninth month. Our God had dictated a message to his people with the express purpose that they would turn from their evil ways and in doing so find his forgiveness. So when the people heard this message from God, um, they wept and wailed, they tore their clothing, and they said to each other, and this is in the Bible, it says, we must report these words to the king. It's a picture of what we've been trying to say today. This is what we all need to be doing. We need to be reporting what God says to the king, or our prime minister, or our premier, whoever it is. I love the way the story is described in the book of Jeremiah, and this is what I uh, love to do with my grandchildren, because we're told that King Jehoiakim was sitting in his winter house, 
with a fire burning before him in a fire pot. And in comes Jehudu with the with Jehudi, Jehudi, Martin, Jehudi? I'll say Jehudi. <laughs> he will be Jehudi and we will call him Jehudi. <laughs> when you meet him in heaven, please don't tell him I called him Jehudi because it might not be the right word. So Jehudi reads out the scroll to the king and as he does, the king takes the scroll, tears off bits and throws them into the fire. Um, and we're told that the king, as opposed to his people, showed no fear at what God said, but he rather then sent his people, advisors, to arrest Jeremiah and his scribe who had written the scroll. But it tells us in the Bible that God had hidden them. I think that's the best game of hide and seek that you could ever imagine. Can you imagine God hiding you? No one will ever find you if God hides you. So I think that's pretty... My, my grandchildren were pretty amazed that God played hide and seek. Um, so none of us are probably book burners and we wouldn't burn God's word to us. But like King Jehoiakim, we too can easily disregard God's word and we can even treat it with disdain or take it lightly. And I believe that what we do, we do to our peril. So what does God's word say to us about the things I've just mentioned? Well, I'm just going to read them straight through because they speak for themselves. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Perhaps very po most powerfully is Jesus' words, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I have people say to me, well, it's just looking at an image. I say, no, Jesus actually said that this is adultery. I have people say to me, well, I've been able to cut it down. I'm only watching pornography once a month now. And I say, so you're only committing adultery once a month and you think that's okay. Jesus didn't think it was okay. This is the will of God, your sanctification. What is God's intention for humanity? Oh, I... How do we cope in a sexually impure world that we inhabit? We go again back to God's word. And God says in his word, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Flee. Submit. Flee. And, you know, I think we talk a lot about... Um, Sexual addiction being a, an addiction and I think sometimes we use that as a cover for us just not making decisions to actually flee from sin. The Bible also says this, it says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A city broken into and left without walls is actually a city that has been absolutely devastated and it is open to every single attack that comes from without. And so what God is saying to us is one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And if you are walking in the Spirit and if you're following after me, then you'll be developing self-control. And, and a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. And so what God wants us to actually strive for is holiness. And, and on our son's wall, we had this verse and it said, How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. And I want to urge you all today to seek after holiness. If anybody wants my slides with the verses, please don't hesitate to contact anyone from um, ACL and we can send you the slides. But it's not just men who the, ver who the um, scriptures speak to in terms of holiness because the, in Timothy it says, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. There is a responsibility on men and women to live holy lives and we believe in the power of prayer do we believe what it says then when it says if I had cherished iniquity in my heart the Lord would not have listened this is we're, we're urging you today to pray for our new prime minister we're urging you to pray for our country and yet the scriptures say if we cherish iniquity in our heart the Lord would not have listened but on the flip side James says the prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve and so my final injunction today as I close is I want to leave this verse for you because it's like, for me, this verse is like that warm lavender oil that I sometimes rub on my temples if I've got a headache, that beautiful, calming um, yeah, oil over a troubled brow. This is God's will for his people. Finally, what is, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is God's will for his people and I urge us all to choose it today and to live. Thank you.